morning, church. Uh, welcome to another uh, great day for church. Uh, welcome if you're online. Uh, we're going to start, as usual, by singing praise to our God uh, with one we haven't done for a little while called Endless Light. So please stand and join with us. Father God, thank you that you are uh, the light on the hill for all of us and thank you that you have given us Jesus to point us towards you and to show us how we can live with you for eternity. Lord, help us today to realise the gift that you've given us through Jesus. Uh, help us to see that he is the true light that points towards you. And Lord, thank you that uh, we have every reason to give him praise. Amen. Uh, next song, we're going to sing I Praise the Name. <coughs> my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds 
His hands, His feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid Him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed. By heavy soul, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forever. Father God, we just want to thank you so much for who you are, and we are thankful that your son Jesus entered the world. And Father, we know that he is the light of the world as it describes him in John's gospel. Father God, we're so thankful that we can come together and worship him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our friends, uh, please take a seat. It's wonderful that you can join us today. And as we, uh, I guess, have a, a service with a bit of a difference. And uh, this passage uh, during the week, or this verse, I should say, during the week, uh, I was just thinking about uh, as I looked around my neighbourhood and seeing many people start to set up lights. And this is what it says in John 8, chapter 12. Oh, sorry, John 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So what is Jesus saying? Well, he's saying, I am the true light. 
I am the light of the world, but not just the light of the world. I am the light of life. I give life to everything. And when we think back to the start of John's Gospel, where we see that Jesus is there in the beginning, isn't he? And then he comes into the world and he shines the light into the darkness. And he is the only light. He is the light of life. Uh, So today we'll be, I guess, reflecting on who Jesus is as the light of life. But we'll also be thinking about how we shine our light into our community. And our community being both people inside the church and also those, our neighbours around us outside the church. So I hope uh, we have a wonderful service together as we focus on our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Friends, I'm going to invite up my friend, Sonali, and we're just going to have a, an interview, actually. Hello, Sonali. How are you? Uh, friends, um, Sonali, uh, as you might be aware, is on Parish Council. And... Sonali is not only a gift to our church, but she's also a gift to our parish council. And this year particularly, uh, Sonali has been encouraging us how we practice hospitality to people who live in our community. And as a church, I'm reflecting on those words that we heard in Hebrews 13 not that long ago. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. And I guess for me, yes, and probably for you, a stranger may be somebody uh, who you've never met. Uh, They come into your life and that's a stranger. But also if we extend stranger, like we extend the word hospitality, not just to be providing food, but actually welcoming people, when you think about it, I come from a different background to Sonali. So I'm a stranger in terms of understanding her culture. I've got to try hard to understand her culture. But then put me in Marsden Park where I've got uh, a neighbour who is in, where is he, from the east, northeast of India, another one who is from the south of India. They're they're actually completely different to each other. Uh, they, They share some common bonds, but there is a difference there as well. So, I'm glad we have Sonali. Sonali is wonderful. I'm, yeah, give her a clap. You never thought you were going to get clapped up here, did you? But I'm going to ask some questions to Sonali as she's been helpful for me and also for Parish Council and for others in the church. I'm um, Hopefully she'll be helpful to all of us uh, in a- these answers to the questions. So, how could we practice hospitality inside our church to people who are here and the new people who might come? Um, I think especially for people from my culture, community is very important. And hospitality is something we use to build a sense of community. Um, At church, we do morning tea, supper, potluck, lunches. I think those are all great ways of showing hospitality. But it's also important, I think, to bear in mind how we do this. Um, For example, if you invite me to your home for a meal, once I get there, I would also like you to invite me to have the food that's set in front of me instead of just expecting me to help myself. Um, So at church, we have the service leader who always invites people to stay on um, after the service to have a time of fellowship. But I think we can all play a part in this, where um, if you just look around and you see someone who's new or newish, just make an effort to go up to them and invite them to come with you to have a cup of tea. It just makes it easier for that person to accept the invitation and it's less awkward rather than just going up by themselves to have some refreshments. If you go along with them, it just makes it easier for them, I think. Fantastic. Uh, Now, that's probably thinking inside our church, but what about practising hospitality to our wider community and maybe those in our area who who don't really know who Jesus is? I think for most of us, it's really hard to invite someone to church, um, especially someone from a different religious background. 
And I think it's even harder for the person who is being invited, um, because in some cultures, it's just hard to say no, uh, even if you really want to, because you don't want to offend or hurt the person who is asking you to do something. It's a lot easier to just invite someone for coffee or a meal. It's something everyone can do. Um, if you are from a background like myself from South Asia or Asia, if you have a conversation with us, you'll realize pretty early on that we end up talking about food. That's something we are passionate about. Um, so it's just a great way to connect. Just invite someone for coffee or tea. And once you have built that connection, you'll probably have more opportunities to um, form that bond. And then you have opportunities to have deeper conversations. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, what practical things can we do for people at church who are from a different cultural background uh, feel care for? Um, as I said before, community is something that's very important for people from cultures like myself. Um, and if you are an immigrant, most of the time you don't have a huge support network to help you in times of need. You don't have extended family, you don't have a lot of friends. So this is where church, I think, can play an important role. Um, if you see that someone's been missing or you haven't had contact with them for some time, just call them or text them to see how they're going. If you know they're sick, offer to provide a meal or do a grocery run. And again, I think it's also important to bear in mind how we do this. Um, for example, if, if you know I'm sick and if you just ask me, do you need anything? I'd probably say, um, no, I'm good, thank you. But if you say, oh, I've just made fried rice, can I just drop some off at your place? Yep. It's easier for me to accept because I don't feel that I'm really inconveniencing you. And also, um, if it's like a grocery run, instead of saying, oh, do you need anything from the shops? If I say, oh, I'm going to the shops this afternoon, is there anything I can get you while I'm there? It's easier then for the person to say, oh, yes, can you just buy me a couple of things? It's Yeah, so it's not just... Um, how we do it, but yeah, be mindful of how you word the question. Yep. I think it just makes it easier. Yep. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, those things, Sonali, and uh, they've been very helpful to me in just understanding how uh, I know I'm different to well, I'm different to many people actually, <laughs> uh, but uh, people from different cultural backgrounds and how I then uh, yeah communicate how uh, I guess my. Uh, love for them and how I'd like to care for them and yeah just got to be mindful of that and and do it as you've suggested so really really thankful uh, for you coming up and sharing those things thank you very much our uh, friends uh, let me pray uh, before our children go out to their programs uh, father god we just want to really thank you so much uh, for who you are and thank you that you've actually placed uh, each and every one of us uh, in this area, in particular locations uh, where we can be that light of, of community to those around us. Uh, Father God, we just uh, yeah pray that you would uh, help us uh, with our, our neighbour, help us to love our neighbour uh, in the way that they actually do feel that love. Uh, Lord, just uh, yeah help us to do that. Father God, we pray for... Uh, each and every one of us in this church community, uh, may we be loving each other as brothers and sisters, uh, again, in the way that you want us to. Uh, and, Lord, uh, sometimes that will be different to different people. And, Lord, we just uh, pray that you will give us lots and lots of wisdom to do that. Father God, we do thank you for our children. And, Lord, we uh, thank you that they are the next generation. Father God, we just pray for their ongoing uh, discipleship, their ongoing understanding of your magnificent son, Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would uh, help them, help parents, help the leaders in kids' church, help us all as a church to uh, raise up the next generation in your wonderful son. Father God, we just thank you so much. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, friends. So uh, kids' church time. Explorers, 18 months to five years, uh, go to that door. Uh, we have our jungle, which is K to also year seven. So we're inviting some year sevens in. You're welcome to go if you're in year seven. And if you have a child who is younger than 18 months, well, we have a classroom set up as a parent's room. So you are welcome to uh, use that as well.
Okay, well, it's time to sing again. Uh, please stand and join with us.
My name's Alan, I'm one of the regular members here. We're going to have some time to pray. I'm just going to live a few moments at the beginning of our prayers in silence as we bring before God our prayers and then I'll lead us in corporate prayer together. Let us pray. From Psalm 8, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, have created all things. And from Psalm 103, we praise you, O Lord, we praise your holy name. You forgive all our sins. You crown each of us with your love and with your compassion. You, O Lord, are compassionate and gracious. You are slow to anger. You are full on with your love. O Lord, you do not treat us as we deserve. You do not pay us back when we choose to do our own thing. So great is your love to those who respect you and trust in you. Enable each of us, O Lord, to trust you and to obey you. Lord, you've told us from the end of Ecclesiastes that the, at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, we are to fear you and keep your commandments. The whole duty we have in life is to do just this, to fear you and to keep your commandments. O oh Lord, in Psalm 121, you tell us that you watch over us day and night. You watch over our coming and our going, both now and forever. Lord, we praise you and thank you for that. Father God, we pray for those who are unwell and those that are un unable to gather with us here today. We pray your blessing and your sustain and bless, bring healing and enablement to those that we pray for. Lord, we pray for those who have chosen not to gather with your people regularly. We pray that you'll stir them and us up to meet regularly that we might bring honour and glory to you. Father God, we pray for those who have HSC exams and other exams at this time. We pray for Olivia Keegan, who this week will be completing her HSC. We pray that you'll bless and watch over her and all those that have got to facing assignments and exams. Lord God, we pray for our neighbours and our workmates and colleagues, those who do not yet know you, Lord Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Saviour. We pray, Lord God, that you'll stir us up and give us insight and wisdom to connect with our neighbours and friends. Lord God, that we might be able to be the light of the world through the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you'll stir us up to continue to gather regularly, to provide hospitality to strangers, and to shine out the light of Jesus in our lives. Lord, we pray that you'll bring healing and comfort to those who suffer, to those that we can name quietly in our hearts before you, Lord, to those in the Middle East and in Ukraine, Father God, many of these people we do not know, have never spoken with, or Lord, we pray that you would bring wisdom and insight to our political leaders, our business leaders and community leaders. Lord, we pray that they will choose to do what pleases you. Father God, you are awesome. Thank you for Jesus, whose death and resurrection enables us to connect directly with you. Lord, thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit to enable us to choose to do what pleases you. Lord God, we pray your blessing upon our pastors, Mark and Adam and their families. We pray your blessing on all those in our church who serve us here in so many different ways. Lord, we pray that you'll bless and sustain them. We pray your blessing on Aneshka as she reads in a few moments your word from Ecclesiastes. And Lord, we thank you for Prasanna and pray for him as he opens up your word to us later. We pray, Lord God, for each of us that are watching online today and each of us that are here in this room, that you'd open our hearts and minds to what you say to us today from your word and by your Holy Spirit. Lord God, we pray that you'll stir us up to give generously with great joy to your work, your kingdom work, both here and in other places. Stir us up, Lord, to set out this week, whatever our circumstances might be, to trust in you and to do what pleases you. 
Father God, we pray all of this in the precious and majestic name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's Bible reading is from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light, and the moon and the stars grow dark, and the clouds return after the rain. When the keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those looking through the windows grow dim. When the doors to the street are closed, and the sound of grinding fades, when people rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint. When people are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets. When the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire no longer is stirred. Then people go, and go to their eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken. Before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to the God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, everything is meaningless. Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched out to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads, they collected things like firmly embedded nails, given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this, will, this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Anushka. Good morning, church. Conclusion of the matter. Is it important to have a conclusion? It is very important, right? In a, in a thesis, in a research paper, if you want to identify what the author is trying to say and what the whole research is about, the years spent to research something is identified from the conclusion. And in the court of law, evidences are submitted and the conclusions derived from those evidences makes the ruling positive or negative. So the conclusion marks the end of something and something concrete. So that's what we're going to look about from this passage today and how much more it will be if the conclusion of the matter is about our life. It's about our personal life. It's not a general thing. It's not about someone else. It's about us and our life. So that's where we get at it today. And let's pray and begin our time. Heavenly Father, cause our ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to receive, and wills to submit to your word today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. People have different goals in life and various things to make their lives meaningful. In search of that spark or light or something meaningful, what they think is good for them based on their opinions, their choices, and their understanding about life. But often, people find directionless in their findings. It is because... The purpose is not connected to their choices, and the choices that they make is based on their opinions, and that is not aligned to the purpose. And in this situation, many cultures, religions, even individuals and organizations try to make life meaningful by promising something great. And that's why they exist. And what happens is that people look for 
the light, the spark, something good about to make their life meaningful from these individuals, organizations, cultures, and various religions based on what they think is good for others. While they all fail and fall short to deliver what they promise in terms of bringing some meaningfulness to people who believe in them, we are left with a question, what is the purpose of life? What is the reason that they promised something but they couldn't deliver? And what is the reason that they promised something that is not making anyone's life meaningful? Right? But thankfully, Bible offers a different perspective to life and life's purpose on earth. Today we're going to uh, explore that from the passage read to us earlier from, uh, by Anishka from Ecclesiastes 12. Here in this chapter, the author provides various things as metaphors to convey the purpose of life on earth. And he also helpfully paints two themes, a theme of two sides of life, both the bad, both the good. So he paints both through these metaphors. And he also says why life matters and what truly matters in life. Verse 1. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. This verse emphasizes the importance of making a right choice when time is at your hand, when you're young in life. And this phrase talks to the troubles of life that may overtake or the, youth, the, young, the youthfulness of life may be cut short, or it leads to a different stage of life where issues and challenges of uh, age catching up with someone takes over, which hampers your decision-making skills or understanding. It also reflects how aging and the challenges that come with eventually impacts our interest and the decisions. And verse 2 is a poetic lead-up to the verses that follows next. It talks about what all can take over in advancing age and how it looks like. Let's read verse 2. Before the sun and the light and the moon and stars grow dark and clouds return after rain. What he's trying to say is that before the days you say, I find no pleasure in them, how it will look like. He says, the darkness, the sun's light is off, darkness take over, and the clouds return after rains. He says, the unpredictability of life looks like the rain clouds that comes after again and again. It rained sometime before, I wanted to step out, I think it's good, but I still see clouds outside, I'm not sure whether it's going to rain. That's a situation life takes everyone to when they age when they advance in years. When you advance in years, trouble after trouble after trouble that he lists in the next few verses takes over. It may not be all, but most of it, or one after other. So that's what he talks about. Let's look at how he speaks of these troubles and challenges that the age, advancing in age, brings along. Verses 3 to 5. When the keepers of the house tremble, who are the keepers of the house? The, the hands that work steadily to keep up everything in your life, they are the keepers of your house. He likens a body to a house. And all the metaphors he's using is the house structures. He says keepers of the house, the hands that work steadily to keep your life and keep yourself, maintain everything, starting to tremble. Keepers of the house. Strong men stoop. Who are the strong men in our body? If your body is a house, strong men is your backbone, and your hands, your joints are the st strong men in your body. They tremble, they sag and weaken as people grow in age, and as they advance in age. Grinders cease because they are few. Everyone carries mobile grinders. That's our teeth. People lose teeth as they grow old, isn't it? 
have you come across elderly people when sometimes during the feast, I say, I like this, it's so crispy. They say, I enjoyed it 40 years back, my son, but I can't do it anymore. I love it, but I can't do it anymore, right? That's what he's talking about. The grinders of fuel, it sees. And those looking through the windows grow dim. What does it mean? So beautifully, this poet, the author is a poet, is a king. He poetically says how beautifully your eyelids are like windows. And your pupil of the eye looks like people looking outside your window. They grow dim, fading and blurry vision. That was, that's what he's talking about. Your eyes lose the eyesight, gradual loss of eyesight. When the doors to the street are closed and the sound of the grinding fades, he's talking about hearing loss. Sound of the doors being shut is big. People can hear it. Grinding is always noisy and you can hear it. But people's hearing loss causes them to take attention, take note of any of such things. And it's all fading away. He's talking about gradual hearing loss. When people rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint. He's talking about how when you're aged, you're easily awakened, but still have restless sleep. You're awakened by even a small noise. A beautiful bird's song is waking you up because you're easily awakened. And sleep, a good sleep is hard to come by. But... The bird's sweet bird's song cannot entertain you anymore that you once enjoyed. Songs that once entertained you holds no value or no interest in your life because of fading hearing loss. So that's what he's talking about. When people are afraid of heights and of dangers in the street, it talks to the increased uh, fearfulness to put a foot forward. Have you seen elderly people walking? They are, they, though the ground is flat and plain, they walk carefully. Once I fell uh, in the ground while playing soccer and uh, I got my ankle twisted. For the next few months it took to heal, I was careful. And even after that, at least a year after that, I was careful not to step on something very casually. I could not put a fo uh, foot forward how much more the elderly people look up to see if they are okay to walk. They watch and walk. It's because of the increased fearfulness and the vulnerability that comes along with the age. That's what he's talking about. When almond tree blossoms. In Israel, the almond tree bears a seasonal flower, white in color. He likens the gray hair of men to that white seasonal flower. He says, during the season, almond tree bears white flowers, so has human beings. During their season, as they grow old, gray hairs come out. So that's what he's talking about. And the grasshopper drags itself along and desire no longer is stirred. He's talking about once the active and youthful person who jumped up to go and get things done in a, a quick moment, is no longer encouraged to step up. He feels weighed down by his own body weight. It feels like the grasshopper, which jumped up and flew everywhere, cannot drag itself. Weighed down by their own body weight. They are struggling to move forward. So that's the situation. The elderly enter, not all, if not all, some of them or most of them and the inevitable end. Then people go to their eternal home and the mourners go about in the streets. Once everything is done, people go back to where they come from. They return back to the dust and they die. So that's what he says. People mourn for the loss of the person. And it's, it doesn't stop there. He is going to come up with few more vivid metaphors from verses six to eight, leading on to a different set of uh, things in life. Very beautifully, he pictures it. 
And for the second time, he speaks about remember him. In verse 6, the author urges readers to remember their creator before life reaches its inevitable end. And something in these vivid metaphors that you see in verse 6, for example, how beautifully he captured four different things and all speaks to one thing, that is a precious thing coming to an end. If you look at all the metaphors given there, something precious coming to its end is a common thing. Yet, also it carries a unique meaning to itself. And let's look at verse 6. Remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well. What he's talking about is, before you lose sight of every good thing and the opportunity and time that you have, make a decision. That's one thing. And if you look at single-handedly each metaphor, silver cord represents inheritance, care, and all that one receives from their parents before they being established. Golden bowl represents when human beings are established as a result of their hard work and their own hard work and all that they accomplish in life, and their potential shines bright. That's a picture, golden bowl. And before the picture is shattered, this depicts life's sudden and unexpected end, where plans and efforts come to nothing, symbolizing the fragility and unpredictability of life. And pitcher is nothing but a clay pot or a kind of a jar, right, to fetch water. And someone is at the fountain, they know that water is there for sure, and they have the pitcher, and if it breaks at the fountain, how bad is that? That's between life and death. Sometimes water stands life, uh, between the life and death. That's what he's talking about. And the wheel broken at well. I don't know if you have come across some of the cultural things or you're aware of some of the cultural things. One thing they do at the death of someone is that they break the clay pot. It's a Mesopotamian culture and Sumerian culture, which is adapted in South Asian culture, when someone dies in particular religion, what they do is they break a clay or a glass jar or a clay jar just to symbolize the earth is shattered and it holds no value anymore at the graveyard. And that's exactly what he's talking about. The wheel broken at the well, the image portrays the youthfulness and many plans for life and future that we have coming to an untimely end unexpected and emphasizing how quickly the life can change when you think everything is going good and everything is going strong and you're going to think about the creator sometime in future. Everything might end. That's what he's saying. But what about, he speaks about the verse 7, the dust returns to the ground it came from and the spirit returns to God who gave it. We all know that. We all know that from the Bible. And it's the first thing that we learn, that we all were made from the ground. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. What is meaningless? For who it is meaningless? Why everything is meaningless? We will see that in a bit. But I must, before that, I must confirm or conclude in saying, this chapter is not an exclusive warning to youths to scare them that your life may be cut short, remember your creator, or to tell the elderly people your life is going to be overtaken by troubles one after other. So your elderly age is not going to support you to make a decision to choose your creator, to remember your creator. It's not that. But it's talking about how it is important to make right choices in life when you have time and opportunity. It's not to scare the youth. It's not to scare the elderly. And we've seen people, elderly people at the age of 80 coming to Christ, coming to accept Jesus. We've seen that. So he's not talking about that. He's saying, his point is, 
choose to remember your creator before time passes on and your life gives up on you. That's what he's saying. Verses 9 to 10. Not only was a teacher wise, but also he imparted knowledge to people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find out just the right words and what he wrote was upright and true. Now it's talking about Solomon. The King Solomon who wrote this was the wisest of men during his time at least. He knew everything and he researched. And Ecclesiastes 2.10 says, in his own admission, he did not keep any pleasures of life from his uh, doing. He enjoyed everything. He was a man who had everything at his disposal and his, at his choice, he enjoyed everything. And this man was wise, was rich enough to do anything and everything in life. And he says he searched everything to come up with right words. And what he wrote was upright and true. Is it talking about Solomon's writing? Because Solomon wrote many things, many other things. There can be only one thing said of upright and true. That's God's word. And he's talking about the word of God that is upright and true. How do we know that? If we look at the next two verses, we'll learn he's not talking about his own writing. He's talking about God's word. Verses 11 and 12. The words of the wise are like goats. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Solomon was not that one shepherd. One shepherd is a reference not to any of the gods anywhere else, any man. It is only reference and it is particularly unique and very, uh, what is it, systematically put in order. Shepherd, that one shepherd is a good shepherd, that's a God. The words of wise are like goats. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Now look at the sufficiency of the Bible. You and me are not like Solomon. We are not rich enough, we are not wise enough, we are not great enough to call ourselves or put ourselves in comparison with someone like Solomon. He is the wisest of men during his time. But the sufficiency of the Bible is that the shepherd that we have, our creator, has given everything that we need. What Bible says, God is my shepherd, I shall not want. Solomon, being a rich person, being a wise person, had to do everything to try out and seek a wisdom and the way of life, which is given to you and me at Sunday school level. When we go to Sunday school, the first thing they teach is God made mankind from the dust of the ground. Isn't it? That's exactly what he says. And the wisest man found one thing, the dust returns to the ground and the spirit goes back to God. All of us know that. Sufficiency of the word of God. The word of God is sufficient in our life to prove and provide anything that we need. To take care of us till the end. And another beautiful thing is that he says, rightly, the shepherd what is the difference between life and death for a sheep is the voice of the shepherd. The voice of the shepherd corrects, protects, leads, nourishes, takes care, feeds. Where is the voice of God? That's the word of God. Nothing more. Isn't it? There's only one thing that we can say about the word of God that is upright and true and there is no contradictions in it. Right? So Solomon says, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter, verse 30. What he says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Fearing God and keeping his commandments is the duty of all mankind. All that he found was, it's the duty of mankind to fear God. If you ask, what is fear of God? People will say, at least almost Christians will know this. 
it's not the frightening fear that God is bad or will punish if you do wrong, but it's the reverential fear. What do, what do they mean by that? They say the love that forces you, that leads you to follow the word of God, understanding the love and grace of God. It's not the fearful, frightening fear that forces an action, but out of love, understanding God's love and understanding God's grace in our life and how God matters in our life, we choose God over anything against his word. That's reverential fear. So he says, choosing God's word and God's voice as a shepherd and we as sheep is essential and desirable and right and wise. And he says, it's not just an option. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9, 10 to 12 says that. What is the meaning of it? The meaning of it is that wisdom is seeking the wise things that comes of the word of God and choosing to follow it. There are many who listens. There are many who hears, right? But to listen and to put it in practice is what matters in life. Not only fearing God, but all of, also follow the commandments of God. Following the word of God is essential for our life. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it's good or evil. So now, as you know, I told you Bible has no contradictions, right? You can see here it says, follow God fear God and follow his commandments and he will bring every deeds into judgment. What is he talking about here? It says, and he also mentioned it's given by one shepherd. If it comes from one shepherd, there is no contradiction because the shepherd is same. Bible is written over 1,500 years approximately. 40 authors wrote it. But there is no contradictions because it comes from one shepherd. And what is beautiful here in this verse is that God will bring every deed into judgment. Earlier we spoke about meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. We asked a question. We had a question for who it is meaningless, why everything is meaningless, and how come everything is meaningless. For those who seek the light outside, those who seek meaningfulness in doing things based on their own ideas and perspectives of life and opinions and choices, leaving out God and God's word, for them it is meaningless. And their actions will be brought into light one day. And they are the ones who stand in judgment. Bible says clearly, a group of people who believed God, followers of Jesus, will stand in front of him. And they will stand for their reward. And others will stand, those who did not follow God and rejected God and God's word, they will also stand for the judgment. So he's talking about two types of life here. One who chooses the word of God, follow the commands, and they have the first fear. The fear of the Lord, that is a reverential fear we, was, we were talking about earlier. And those who lack the fear of God and following commands, they will stand fearfully looking up to their judge for their judgment. Friends, this chapter is not to scare again. It is to give you the idea or the perspective, the end of matter, the conclusion is that fear God and follow his commands and that's our duty. It's not an option, it's our duty. And doing so, we will one day face our Lord with gleefully, joyfully we'll face him for the reward. And that day will be a beautiful day where we will meet our creator. So life is much more in action, much more than what we think. Fear the Lord and follow his commands. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your grace and you saved us by your precious sacrifice on the cross. And you're able and your word is sufficient to provide and prove and give us everything that we need in our life. We thank you. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, we submit our time and we also ask you to help us put our learning into practice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Okay, let's stand and respond in song uh, with a song called See the Light. Friends, uh, please take a seat. Uh, just a few uh, community news announcements. Uh, firstly, uh, coming up actually uh, this Saturday is the men's breakfast. And uh, it's actually uh, one thing that we need you to do is to RSVP uh, to that. That would be absolutely fantastic. If you're coming along, uh, go to marsdenpark.church. Uh, men's brekkie, and you can RSVP there. Uh, and the cost is $5. You can pay your $5 online or pay it uh, on the day. That would be wonderful. So please RSVP to that. And we'll hear, obviously, from Rob Abood, but also we'll hear a testimony from our men's ministry powerhouse, as it's written here, uh, Ross Baker. Uh, so we're looking forward to that as well. Uh, the next thing, uh, another thing that we obviously uh, 
want you to uh, get involved with. And I guess the first thing is to think, who are you going to invite to our gingerbread decorating? But the second thing is, as you can see there in the sort of red colour, which looks more red up the back, but that's all right, uh, oh, <laughs> uh, is uh, Early Bird is going to close this week. But most importantly, if you have a family of gluten-free people and on Christmas Day you want to have a, a gingerbread house that is gluten-free, uh, these kits need to be ordered a whole lot more earlier than the rest of the kits. Uh, so we're asking you to uh, RSVP to the gingerbread decorating this week if you want a gluten-free kit. And if you don't, well, the price will go up, but that's all right. You've got the option of RSVPing. But uh, please do that. Please, uh, you can even RSVP now if you want because the link's there on the screen. Uh, lastly, and the next slide is we're starting our Toys and Tucker uh, um, appeal for this year. And uh, last year we had a fantastic response and it was wonderful to see people brings a whole lot of great stuff that goes to families who are in need and obviously can't afford maybe the same Christmas that we might be able to afford. Now what's going to happen is we have uh, a list on that petition there, the other side obviously, that tells you what Toys and Tucker need and then there's also a crate there that you can put in your donations and that crate will be collected uh, at the 5 p.m. service uh, every single day and there's a member, Brenda Smythe, who is co coordinating that collection. So uh, please give generously to Toys and Tucker. Friends, uh, we're going to have lunch after the service. We're going to have a bit of tea and coffee, a little bit of morning tea, uh, but we'll uh, enjoy a lunch together. So wonderful if you can stay around for that. And friends, for those uh, who are regular to our church, who I guess class themselves as part of this church. Uh, thank you for giving to our church. And uh, if you don't know how to do that, uh, if you want to find out ways to give uh, various uh, different ways, then go to marsandpark.church slash give. And lastly, uh, you might have some feedback about today. You might have some prayer points uh, that you want me to pray for and Adam to pray for, uh, you can use our Connect card to do that. There's obviously physical cards on the welcome desk, but also, as you can see there, that URL, which will take you to an online card, and that will go to me, and I can pray for you or follow you up uh, if you have any needs. Our friends, uh, how about I close this service in prayer? Father God, we do thank you that you are the one shepherd. You are the great shepherd. And Father God, we know that you love us. And we also know that you sent your son Jesus, who is the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He is the light of the world. He is the light of life. And he's the only one that can take us out of darkness. Father God, we are so thankful that you give us your word and your word helps us to live. We are so thankful that we are saved by your son, Jesus. Father, help us all here today to love Jesus, but to also be his shining light where you have placed us in this community, in our workplace in the place we do our hobbies. You have placed us there and you want us to be your light. Please help us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.